Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to learn a bit more about hip replacement. We'll start by talking about the background of hip replacement and arthritis, followed by some historical information on hip replacements, and then discuss the improvements that have taken place, and lastly, discuss where the future might be in hip replacements. The following are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to my current presentation. Before we can really dive into hip replacements, it's worthwhile understanding who gets a hip replacement, which really gets at what are the surgical indications for a hip replacement. First, the patient must have significant radiographic disease, which for me is gonna be moderate to severe arthritis. And second, as a hip and knee replacement surgeon, I don't save lives, I save lifestyles. So the patient must have severe symptoms, which is often subjective and, the pa and the patient specific that I refer to as the enough is enough indication. Then third, there's no surgeon or hip replacement design that's capable of making the patient's hip function like it did in their 20s. So the patient must have realistic expectation as to what a hip replacement will deliver for them. Fortunately, the modern hip replacement will allow patients to do anything that they want to do for the most part. For that reason, after three months following a standard hip replacement, I tell my patients that they have no restrictions and can do whatever the hip lets them do. But the only thing I wouldn't do myself if I had my hip replaced would probably uh, be high impact activities like long distance running. But even then, new literature is starting to show that patients are actually returning back to running after hip replacements without issue. And lastly, the patient needs to be healthy enough to undergo a hip replacement. Historically, it only, in, it only included the medical preoperative clearance to help reduce medical complications by making sure that the patient was healthy enough to tolerate the stress of surgery. However, we have started to see the clearance process for a joint replacement is not only attempting to minimize medical complications, but also surgical complications. Hence, the reason some patients with a too low BMI or too high BMI or poorly controlled diabetes might satisfy all the other indications but aren't offered surgery until those risk factors can be modified and optimized. When we're evaluating a patient's radiographs for arthritis, the first thing I look for is the presence of joint space narrowing. The joint space is comprised of cartilage and I think about it like tread on a tire, whereby a bald tire is bone on bone arthritis. Here we can see this patient has a nice joint space in their right hip, but on their left hip, they have bone on bone arthritis and with complete loss of the joint space. Other radiographic clues of arthritis are gonna be osteophyte formation, which we refer to as bone spurs. You're gonna get subchondrosclerosis, which is whereby with the loss of cartilage, the bone is experiencing much greater stresses, and so therefore it tries to harden and becomes much more dense. And then there's subchondral cyst. This is where the, you get little micro fractures in the bone without the, with the loss of cartilage, and that allows uh, joint fluid to kind of seep down into the bony areas, and that then creates this cyst of joint fluid. And then you can also have deformity present in the, in the, uh, in the joint. So in terms of the natural history of arthritis, if we were to draw a graph with, the, with time on the x-axis and severity of symptoms on the y-axis, we would see the natural history of arthritis is characterized as progressively worsening symptoms with associated arthritic flares. It's typically during arthritic flares that we see patients in our office. So the purpose of treatment really is to reduce the symptoms associated with the flare because once arthritis is started, there's really no way for us to reverse the damage, the cartilage damage that's been done. So it's really all about managing the patient's symptoms and getting them their function back. However, the progressive nature of arthritis is that patients typically will never go back to their pre-flare pre baseline level of symptoms. And then over time, the peaks of the flares typically become longer and the valleys between them typically become shorter. To highlight the progressive nature of arthritis, this is a patient who was 52 years old in 2011 when she tweaked her hip playing tennis and was seen shortly afterwards for worsening uh, hip pain. Eventually her hip, went, hip, hip pain subsided, but she continued to have these intermittent flares until she presented in my office in, two, in 2020 
with severe arthritis and underwent a hip replacement. So what is a hip replacement and how is it done? If you haven't seen this before, I suggest you check it out. There are these videos of this mother and her three-year-old son who perform Plato surgeries, uh, one of which is actually a hip replacement. So if you're ever wanting to check out what goes into a hip replacement, but you want to avoid watching an actual surgery with all the uh, blood, uh, they actually do a pretty decent job of covering all kind of the, the basic steps of a, of a hip replacement. The hip replacement uh, has often been cited as one of the most successful operations in all of medicine. To accomplish it, we surgically approach the hip, which for me is usually a direct interior approach that allows me to saw through the femoral neck and discard the diseased arthritic uh, bone or ball. That gives me access to the socket where we essentially use a hemispherical cheese grater to scrape away the diseased arthritic bone and cartilage in the socket side of your hip that makes room for this titanium shell that has a roughened surface on the back side that your bone will grow into. We also can provide, there's also some recessed holes in the uh, shell that allows us to put screws in there for supplemental fixation. And then we lock in a piece of plastic called polyethylene into that titanium shell. The femur then is actually a, a tube and we use uh, instruments called a brooch to help clean out the inside of the, the, the femur that makes room for this titanium uh, stem that has a roughened surface on the outside that your bone eventually grows into. And then put on top of that either a ceramic ball or a uh, or a metal ball, and that essentially uh, constitutes a total hip replacement. But before there was the, the modern hip replacement, we had many different iterations of a hip replacement. To fully appreciate today's modern hip replacement, I find it interesting to look at where things started. The first hip replacement was, was actually performed in, eight, in the 1890s in Germany by Dr. Gluck who used an ivory prosthesis that he had machined. And then um, it wasn't until eventually in the 1940s with Dr. Austin Moore that we actually switched to uh, metal prostheses. It was then Sir, Sir John Charnley who performed the first low friction uh, hip replacement in 1962. There was a metal ball articulating on a polyethylene or plastic uh, liner whereby both were fixed to the bone with bone cement called polymethylmethacrylate or PMMA, which became the basis of the modern day hip replacement. In fact, it was the founder of Rothman Orthopedic Institute, Dick Rothman, who traveled to the UK to learn from him and brought this hip replacement to Philadelphia. Although uh, Dr. Charlie's low friction hip replacement was a huge leap forward from its predecessors, it it was still plagued by several problems with the most common being aseptic loosening, polyethylene wear, and dislocation. Aseptic loosening was referred to as cement disease because over time the cement would loosen from the bone and the implant would no longer be fixed to the, to the bone. As we can see here, this was a cemented prosthesis and it, you can see how it's kind of one, there's multiple, this patient unfortunately has multiple issues that's going on that I had to address, but uh, their prosthesis is no longer fixed to the bone because the cement is pulled away from the, the bone. Then there's polyethylene wear, uh, which, is, which would leave behind particulate debris that the bone would react to, causing localized bone loss. And then lastly, there was dislocation, which is when the ball would pop out of the socket. So, so in terms of solving the problems that we had and that faced us, uh, the first one was solving the problem of cement disease. So cement fixation is static, meaning that the fixation is about as good as it will ever get as soon as the cement is hardened in the, op in the operating room. In order to solve the problem of cement disease, the solution was to use the body's bone to get biological fixation. Just as bone will grow to unite two ends of a of a broken bone, the thought was to take advantage of this property and get the bone to grow into the surface on the implant. Bone cells are very particular in that they don't like to grow to bridge between two ends if there's too much motion or the size of the openings in the new space are too large. So by studying these properties of bone, we found the ideal pore size for bone ingrowth. 
The person pictured here is actually George Galante. He was the pioneer in cementless hip replacements. He was the first uh, chairman of orthopedics at Rush in Chicago, where I did my residency, and is largely credited with helping place Rush on the map as consistently being ranked among the top orthopedic hospitals in the country. What he did was very interesting. He combined his orthopedic knowledge with his uh, background in metallurgy and engineering to develop a porous surface in the, made out of titanium in the 1980s, which became known as here, this, this being the Harris Galante uh, hip replacement. It is actually been successful. The porous surface that you see here on the backside of this uh, implant is still widely used today in many implants. The, the premise behind today's cementless hip replacement is that you get immediate stability by press fitting the implant into the bone, which means that we essentially make a space that is slightly uh, smaller than the actual implant so that it, it gets press fit in there and your bone kind of gives it a big bear hug, holding it in place while your bone then grows into the implant over the subsequent six to 12 weeks. Then the, uh, but this isn't the, to say though that cemented hip replacements are a bad thing. In fact, I will commonly do cemented femoral stems on patients being treated for hip fractures or patients with poor bone quality because performing a press fit cementless stem in those patients have been associated with a higher risk of reoperation and periprosthetic fracture. The next issue to solve was the problem of polyethylene wear. As wear occurs, it leads to polyethylene particular debris that the body's white blood cells will consume and then sets off this chemical cascade. The cascade is actually the same process that leads to osteoporosis, which is why the patient's bone locally, locally experiences loss of bone that we refer to as osteolysis. Pictured here is a patient that I've taken care of that has a significant amount of polyethylene wear, and we know that because uh, when, this, when we implant these in, the, the ball should be sitting very centered within, the, within the, the metal shell, but you can see here that the ball has worn up and out and is sitting much closer to the top part of the shell than the bottom part of the shell. Then secondly, this patient has experienced a significant amount of bone, uh, bone resorption in the, in the top part of their femur, whereby you can see the, the difference in the density of the bone down here versus up here, uh, higher up, where the patient has had this debris uh, lead to this localized loss of bone. Eventually, some smart engineers and orthopedic surgeons discovered that if they radiated the plastic, it caused it to become highly cross-linked, making it uh, incredibly resistant to wear. However, it wasn't just as easy as irradiating the polyethylene uh, to solve the problem. In fact, irradi irradiating the polyethylene then created free radicals that caused oxidation and breakdown of the polyethylene. So a process had to be developed to help remove those free radicals that we refer to as annealing or remelting, which then gets rid of the, the free radicals. Therefore, in the early 2000s, companies began offering highly cross-linked polyethylene that has essentially gotten rid of the problem of, of osteolysis and polyethylene wear. In fact, it has been so successful that I'm likely the last generation of orthopedic surgeons will, who will have treated patients with polyethylene wear-induced osteolysis. Then we've also found what material we use on the ball also has an effect on the wear rates with a ceramic ball articulating on a polyethylene liner as having incredibly low rates of wear. The picture here helps to, to try to show, put things in perspective with just how much, how much lower the wear rates have gotten compared to older, older versions of polyethylene. So when we look here, this is kind of a, a, a picture of a old, older version of uh, plastic with a metal head showing that it wore at a close to 200 microns per year. And then once we, uh, brought about the new polyethylene with that same metal ball. It brought our wear rates down to about 20 microns per year. And then if we actually take that same polyethylene in this scenario and then go down here to, uh, to this one where we put a ceramic ball in there, it actually shows that the, we wear down to less than 10 microns per year. And to put that in perspective, 10 microns is really 0.1 millimeters uh, per year, and 
it, most at most times patients at the very least they're getting five millimeters if not significantly more polyethylene put into their liner so if you do the math on that just even at this at the thinnest polyethylene currently on the market it pretty much gives you close to 500 years of wear uh, distance in your polyethylene, which is a dramatic improvement from the, the past. In terms of stability, there's really three ways to achieve stability in the hip. One is the component positioning, which as a surgeon, we have complete control over that. The second one is the size of the ball. So the bigger the ball, the bigger the distance the ball has to travel. And so that's what this picture is trying to show you, is that this, this ball has a much shorter distance to travel than the bigger ball does for it to pop out of the, the socket. But then also too, the other advantage of a, of a larger ball is that you get a bigger arc of motion because you have a better, what we call head neck ratio. So a bigger uh, ratio of a larger uh, diameter of a ball to the diameter of the, of the neck, which allows for uh, increased stability. But we also are def uh, confined by the patient's bone. We'll often dictate what size metal socket we can put in, the, put in there, which then in turn dictates what size of a ball that we can put in there. Then the next way in which we can get gain stability in the hip is gonna be through soft tissue tensioning. So you can imagine if the, if the muscle surrounding the hip is uh, lax and isn't tensioned appropriately, that muscle can, uh, or that, that hip can kind of toggle around and more easily pop out. So we have ways in which to uh, accommodate that and increase the tension on the, on, the, on the muscle to improve the stability in the hip. Then um, by having additionally to the other thing that we, what we were able to do is that by having polyethylene liners that are more resistant to wear, it meant that we could start to put in a thinner polyethylene liner that is allowed for larger heads. Then the concept of dual mobility was also developed, which uh, you can see here in this picture. Most conventional uh, metal shells have a polyethylene liner that locks into it, and the head articulates on the, the liner. In dual mobility, you have a very smooth inner surface of this metal liner by which a large polyethylene ball articulates on it with another uh, smaller ball inside of it that then sits on top of the femoral stem. Therefore, you can imagine you can, how much a, we can get a much bigger ball into the socket, which is gonna provide uh, that better head-neck ratio, as well as uh, improve stability through the uh, better jump distance. Then in terms of surgical approach, the posterior approach has historically been the primary workhorse approach, but has gotten a bad name for being associated with dislocations. The rates of dislocation have dramatically gone down with improvements in the surgical technique by repairing the capsule and the short external rotator muscles in the back of the hip. However, one of the other drivers for improved stability has been the popularization of anterior-based approaches, whereby it appears the rate of dislocation could be lower than the posterior approach. And then lastly, we're still waiting to see if robotics can help to individualize patients' cup position to reduce dislocation, but at the present time, we definitely are not there yet with the technology. Then the question is worth asking, have these improvements led to better implant survivorship? This graph was published by the UK National Joint Registry in 2019 and demonstrates how the more recent implants are having better survivorship than the implants of the past, which shows the benefits of the advancements that we've had in hip replacement designs. So although we've seen tremendous advancements in hip replacement uh, design and surgical technique, by and large, the hip replacements from 10 years ago are very similar to the implants we're putting in today. Many of the implant design improvements have been very subtle things to allow an implant company to say they've got the newest, latest, greatest thing on the market. Therefore, much of the advancements in the past decade have come from outside of the surgical technique and dealt with our post-operative management of the patients through blood conservation strategies and the use of multimodal analgesia for post-operative pain control. 
Although Benjamin Franklin's well-known quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, was written in 1735 regarding the prevention of fires in Philadelphia, it resonates with the concept of blood conservation. The goal regarding transfusions shouldn't be focused on how to make a transfusion safer through you going and donate, donating blood before the surgery or asking if a, having a designated donor, such as a family member, donate a transfusion for you but instead efforts should be focused on achieving zero transfusion through preoperative optimization, reducing blood loss, and improved postoperative blood management to prevent the need for transfusion. Blood conservation strategies are, cate are categorized as preoperative, intraoperative, or postoperative interventions. Listed here are items that have been studied and described and methods to help reduce blood loss and transfusion in primary total joint arthroplasty. However, many of these have fallen out of favor because they are not cost effective or are less effective than alternative strategies. Given our time constraints, we'll really only discuss the, the most widely used and effective strategies that include the use of antifibrolytic anti drugs and restricted transfusion thresh thresholds. So when the body experiences an injury, whether it's accidental from falling or controlled like from the surgery, the body works to make a fibrin clot, such as here in this pathway, in the coagulation pathway, where it sets off a pathway that leads to fibrin that, that acts as a clot that helps stop the bleeding. However, your body also has a competing pathway to dissolve and break down that fibrin clot. Uh, therefore, Fiber, antifibrinolytic drugs are used as, during the operation to temporarily block the body's uh, pathway for breaking down the clot and in turn reduces the blood loss. So antifibrinolytic drugs are thought to be clot stabilizers and not clot promoters. There are three antifibrinolytic drugs, a, a, but aprotonin was actually pulled from the market because of a higher risk of cardiac death compared to the other two drugs. In orthopedics, transemic acid has become the predominant antifibrinolytic drug that we use. Although it is still slightly more expensive than uh, aminocoproic acid, transemic acid is much more potent and achieves higher concentrations within the, within the joint itself, which is why it has remained a popular choice among orthopedic surgeons. Since we predominantly use transemic acid and, it, and a large body of literature exists, I led the clinical practice guidelines for the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, along with the su supportive network meta-analyses that helped answer the question about dose, route of administration, and timing of dose. Essentially, the guidelines found with a strong recommendation that all routes of administration were effective, no one route of administration was more effective, and higher doses aren't necessarily more effective. Lastly, the guidelines found with a moderate recommendation that giving giving you the drug either before an incision is made or in the preoperative holding area is more effective than waiting until the surgery has started or giving it postoperatively. Clearly, anytime we're dealing with a medication acting on the coagulation cascade, concerns are raised regarding the safety of the medication and causing blood clots. The clinical practice guidelines also address this issue regarding safety, noting that with a strong recommendation that patients without a history of a blood clot do not have an increased risk of developing a blood clot. When it comes to patients with a history of blood clots, a moderate recommendation was made that it does not appear to increase a patient's risk of an arterial or a venous blood clot. One of the rationales behind this recommendation stem from what we call the number needed to harm and the number needed to treat, which showed that we would have to give 983 patients the medication to attribute a blood clot to transemic acid. Well, you really only need to give it to three or four patients to prevent a transfusion. Given patients with a higher comorbidity burden may actually benefit the most from the reduction in blood loss associated with, TX, with transemic acid administration and the lack of evidence of harm, it seems reasonable for these patients to get the TXA. As additional support regarding the safety, a few well-done database studies from Mayo have shown no harm for high-risk patients receiving this. So it is my opinion that an allergy to transemic acid is really the only contraindication for patients getting transemic acid, 
who are undergoing an elective primary total joint arthroplasty who have undergone medical clearance. Another way to prevent a transfusion is having a better understanding of who actually is likely to benefit from the transfusion. As more effort has been placed on preventing transfusions, research has focused on determining hemoglobin thresholds for a transfusion. The most recent guideline is the 2018 Frankfurt Consensus Conference that provided a hemoglobin threshold of less than seven for when to give a transfusion to a patient with the exception of patients being treated for a hip fracture who should have a higher uh, hemoglobin threshold of less than eight. In terms of our advancements in post-operative pain control, it started with a better understanding of pain physiology. Types of pain are broken down into two broad categories of noceptive and neuropathic types, pain, types of pain. Noceptive pain occurs when tissue damage, whereas neuropathic pain occurs after damage to the nerve, occurs after damage to the nerve itself. By understanding the types of pain, we can use medication specifically directed at each type of pain. For instance, surgery is essentially a controlled trauma to the tissue, which leads to an inflammatory response in the tissue. The resulting inflammatory response leads to hypersensitization of the peripheral nerves, making them send a much stronger pain signal to the brain. Therefore, use of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen can diminish the inflammatory response and make the degree of hypersensitization of the nerve less. Whereas neuropathic pain can be managed well by injecting a local anesthetic during the surgery. It is the recognition of the different types of pain that has brought about the concept of multimodal analgesia, which is the use of adjunctive medications with different mechanisms of action to reduce the reliance on opioids and limit medication-related side effects. Although it seems like a bit of a duh concept, it's actually a relatively new revelation in post-operative pain management. Plus, we have worked to get away from general anesthesia and towards neuroaxial anesthesia, also known as a spinal or epidural, because it, is, because it seems to be a bit safer in the heart and lungs, but it also provides better pain control. When patients wake up from surgery with neuroaxial anesthesia, they typically are still numb, which means that they can wake up comfortably and start to take oral pain medications that will provide more consistent pain relief than IV pain medications. On the flip side, once the patient with general anesthesia is woken up, they immediately start to feel pain, but they're, not, but they're usually too groggy to start taking pills, so we have to give them IV pain medications that don't provide as long of uh, relief and perpetuates that grogginess, meaning it takes a bit longer before we can give the patient the more effective oral pain medications. And then in terms of common pain medications, we typically will rely on several classes of medications that are gonna include opioids, gabapentinoids, acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and then our local anesthetics, whether they're injected as a periarticular local anesthetic infiltration, or as a regional nerve block by the anesthesiologist. As you can imagine, when you're dealing with all these medication cocktails, there are a lot of various combinations and doses you can use. Therefore, it kind of became the Wild West in terms of everyone publishing a ton of literature on the topic and people making pain protocols based off of a single study. In order to improve the standardized treatment for patients, my colleague Charlie Han and I led the effort of the American Academy, or sorry, the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons to develop a clinical practice guideline that looked at all the best available evidence to make recommendations for surgeons. This amounted us to looking at almost more than 10,000 uh, published articles to get to the, uh, the final recommendations for surgeons to use. And as a result, we are now able to better understand what works and what doesn't work among the popular pain medications. We've really covered here a, a broad spectrum, including the basics of hip replacements to the early hip replacements to recent advancements. Lastly, I wanna to briefly touch upon where the future potentially exists in hip replacements. In my past position on faculty at Dartmouth College, 
I got to work at the Thayer Engineering Implant Retrieval Lab. It's actually the second largest implant, implant retrieval lab in the country. Uh, and so there we've got, there were some very intelligent engineers uh, who have spent more than half a century looking at why implants fail and from an engineering standpoint, uh, what can be done to improve them. When you really sit down and, and talk with them, they all feel like we have probably fully optimized hip replacement implants. Hence the, the reason the, the most recent advancements in hip replacement haven't really come from how we, uh, what we use to implant into patients, but more of how we manage patients postoperatively. Therefore, the future of hip replacements will likely see the largest growth regarding periprosthetic joint infection. Although it really only occurs in about one to 2% of patients having a total joint replacement, when we perform more than a million hip replacements annually in the US, you can see how even a rare complication can lead to a large number of events. We've learned over a We've learned a lot over the past decade about who's at risk for the postoperative complication. So we will likely begin to now start to translate that research into learning more about how to best optimize the patient at risk before surgery to help reduce that risk. Plus, we might see patient changes in implant designs that help improve or prevent infection, whereby there's been uh, attempts to try to covalently bond antibiotics to the implants so that the when you have uh, an infection starting in a joint, there's a change in the pH so that what they can do is it that change in pH kind of causes the, the antibiotic to suddenly be released from the, the implant, hopefully thereby uh, eradicating the infection before it actually becomes uh, an, an issue. And then also, um, people have looked at uh, dragonfly wings and the geometry of the dragonfly wings. As we can see here, this is a, a electron scanning microscopy of a dragonfly wing with bacteria. And it's this, the geometry of the surface of this essentially causes the bacteria, once it lands on it, to essentially become eviscerated and tear it apart. So it's kind of almost looking to nature to see how we could potentially use that on the surface of an implant so that once a bacteria tries to adhere to the implant, it, it just becomes uh, torn apart. And then as, as well as seeing improvements in the treatment of periprosthetic joint infections, uh, we hope that we can see those through, through improvements in their treatment because really, to be completely honest, uh, there hasn't been much of a fundamental change in how we treat periprosthetic joint infections for several decades. Then lastly, We'll likely to continue to see a greater shift towards anterior-based approaches in the hip as more people like myself are performing direct anterior hip replacements. And then we begin to see more residents and fellows who are exposed to it in their training coming out and starting their practices. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and, and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Fillingham. We did have a few questions that came in. Um, I'll start um, going through them right now for you. Um, someone had a total left hip in 1994 at Rothman. Still functioning, but at age 77, they worry about, refuse, about being refused for a revision. Is it inevitable that I will need a revision? And if so, have they improved over the years? So... Um, it really kind of depends. It, it's all about a risk benefit uh, profile for that for that specific patient. We, we wouldn't say that there's necessarily a particular age cutoff. I mean, for instance, I've I've done revisions on patients who have, who are in their late 90s because they're still very uh, very active, very functional, and they have a hip that's failing them and actually holding them back significantly. So I, I wouldn't say that an age is a strict cutoff for having any kind of revision. Um, and I wouldn't say that just because, um, just because you had your, your hip replaced in, in the 90s when we had the, before we had the new po uh, polyethylene that it's suddenly going to, to fail, um, it, it could very well last you uh, the rest of your life but there is, but the chances of it doing so are, are smaller than if you had the the more the newer polyethylene. But fortunately, 
if you do have a lot of wear in your in your uh, polyethylene liner, uh, most of the implant companies, when they switched over to the new plastic, they they also still they they make the the plastic with the, or they make the same liner that would fit into your socket with new plastic. Um, so usually most of those patients we can treat with just kind of what we call a head and liner exchange. So if you remember that that picture that I showed you with the the gentleman who had really bad uh, polyethylene wear. I actually had just revised him uh, a couple weeks ago, and all that was required was just uh, changing out the plastic liner and giving him a new uh, femoral head. Next question, should I be concerned if I have a nickel allergy? Are any of the replacements made of nickel or potential materials that could cause a reaction? So um, for hip replacements, the sockets, for the most part, are all made out of titanium because they've got a better modulus of elasticity that's more that's more similar to bone. So they're so it, it kind of makes it easier for them to uh, for the bone to grow into it. And titanium is a completely inert metal that there is absolutely no uh, nickel in it, and there's actually been no documented allergy to titanium ever. So, um, and then the same thing with the stem. Most cementless stems are also made out of titanium as well. Um, so patients with a nickel allergy, uh, it's worthwhile making sure that you let your surgeon know about that ahead of time. But um, for the most part, all implants are nickel free in the hip. The only thing that actually does potentially contain some nickel is gonna be that a cobalt chrome head will have a very fra small fraction of nickel in it. So usually uh, with those, Patients, we would always use a ceramic head, but by and large, we're getting to where we're using ceramic heads almost on everybody anyways, because of the fact that we found that um, if you take a cobalt chrome head and put it on top of a titanium stem, you have two dissimilar metals, and that can lead to what we call a galvanic reaction, which is essentially the same reaction that happens in a battery, and then it can lead to corrosion. So the way that we've essentially kind of avoid that issue is by using a, a ceramic head instead of a, a metal head. So, um, so most patients who have a nickel allergy should not have any kind of issues with a, with a total hip replacement or need to be worried about that. Okay. Would a patient be able to sit Indian style after the replacement? So I, uh, yes, I mean, patients are able to sit Indian style after hip replacements. It obviously does play, Place the uh, the patient at a uh, at an increased risk of a dislocation because of uh, of that of that position, but I would say it needs to be avoided for at least the first uh, three months after a hip replacement. Because what happens is that your your body uh, scars in around the hip and then adds additional kind of bumpers. Uh, around the hip to provide uh, st additional stability beyond just what we, we achieve in the operating room. So I, I would hold off, I would tell patients to hold off on doing any kind of Indian style sitting uh, for at least the first three months after their hip replacement. Okay. Is it outpatient surgery? So most, so uh, a lot of hip replacements today are beginning to become more outpatient based procedures finding that patients can get up and get mobile uh, very quickly after the, after the surgery. Um, so I would say that for the, the most part in my practice, about 70% of patients will um, choose to stay overnight in the hospital one night and go home the next day. About uh, 20 to 30 or 20 to 25% of the patients will go home the same day. And then the remaining percentage of patients are usually patients who are uh, much more much more elderly and then uh, might require additional help to kind of get them back on their feet so they stay in the hospital a couple nights before they go home or before they go to a, a rehab center. If you are taking a blood thinner, how long off of the drug do you need to be to have surgery? So, that is completely dependent upon what blood thinner you're taking. So there are um, injectable blood thinners like Lovenox, whereby you just need to you just need to be off of it uh, 
for about a day or so. There's um, oral uh, ones that we kind of call these the novel uh, drugs like Eliquis or Apixaban or Xeralto uh, or Ribavoxaban that are gonna be the, the ones that you take as a pill that you don't have to monitor in your blood. Those usually we want patients off of those uh, about depending upon which one it is, somewhere between uh, 48 to 72 hours. And then depending upon your risk, your individual risk for developing a blood clot, sometimes what will happen is uh, the cardiologist or the hematologist will request that you uh, kind of do something that we call bridging yourself. So you go off of the, the medication, but yet you take the injectable, such as the Lovenox, um, that still provides you with the, the anticoagulation coverage, but only needs to be stopped uh, just the day before surgery so that you, you maximize the, the period of time in which you're kind of protected. And that's really something that the decision that's, that's made in, in concert with uh, your cardiologist or a hematologist before the surgery. When can I expect to be able to play golf after a hip replacement? So I, I tell everybody that um, the, the first kind of one to two weeks after hip replacement, that's kind of when you're second guessing, why in the world would I ever do this? Or that's when you're usually printing my picture out, putting in your dartboard, throwing darts at it. And then by six weeks, it's kind of when most patients see the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And by three months, most patients are doing most things, which means you're probably close to about 85 to 95% recovered. And then you continue to see incremental improvements for up to one to two years after the surgery. In terms of playing golf, it's all on a bell curve. I would say that most patients can usually get back to golf in about six, six weeks or so. But that being said, uh, I've had a patient that called, um, called him up to see how he was doing to check on him. And I hear wind in the background on, on the phone and I kind of made a comment to him. and said, oh, well, you know, it sounds, good. it sounds good that you're getting outside. You're able to get out, maybe go for a little walk around the neighborhood. And he goes, oh, no, actually, I'm rounding the back nine on my second round of, of golf, and this was 10 days post-op. So everybody's on a bell curve, but I would say that the, the middle of the bell curve is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about like six to eight weeks. Okay. Um, if, if someone is, uh, I'm sorry, someone's in extreme pain, but received, but is managing it with shots and physical therapy, so it's more manageable now. Should they wait to have surgery? They're at their age 77. They do a lot of walking. Yeah. So, I mean, to be honest, I, I tell all of my patients and I would, just as I would tell a family member, if they called me asking for advice, um, surgery, a hip replacement is, is usually the, the last result. It's like my, my own mother, um, I, I saw her when I was living in Chicago doing my residency, my, my parents would come up and visit. And um, she had terrible knees to the point where uh, we, would, we would go to a restaurant maybe a block away that you could have easily walked to. But I would go and get the car, drive, take, drop them off at the restaurant. And because parking was awful, I would drive back to the apartment, drop the car off, and then walk on over myself. And I knew that she needed knee replacements long, long ago, but it wasn't, but she wasn't willing to, she felt as though she was still doing okay with it and didn't want to have surgery yet. And then she eventually had her surgery. And now when, when she came to visit, then we were able to walk to the, the restaurant and back. So she's experienced this like great improvement in her function. But really, I tell patients, it's when you're ready for it, that's the right time to have surgery. And, it's, and really, it's, 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 it's a very personal decision. So I would say if you're managing, uh, if it's manageable with non-surgical uh, modalities, there's there are much lower risk to non-surgical modalities than there are surgery. Um, so I really kind of view surgery as a last resort for that. So for that person, I would, I would say continue with what you're doing. And then when, it, when you can't manage it anymore with, that, with those things, that's the time to kind of consider surgery. Do you do revision surgery? If so, what's the time frame from your original surgery? So I, I do perform revision surgery. I would say probably... Um, so when we look across the nation at, in the American Joint of uh, Registry, in the American uh, Joint Registry, it, most orthopedic surgeons who are doing joint replacements do somewhere closer to like about 5% five, 5 of their practices revisions. My practice being at 
having been in an academic tertiary referral center at Dartmouth and then now coming here and being here um, at, a, at a major uh, academic center. Um, about 30% of my practice is revisions because I get a lot of referrals for, uh, from patients, other surgeons coming to me, asking me to see if I can help, help take care of their, uh, their failing joint replacement. And in terms of time frame from, from your original surgery, it really completely depends. It, there's multiple factors that go into it. One, it's, it's do you have the, the modern plastic? Do you have cementless fixation? Um, and then also, uh, because I mean, when I put in a, a primary hip replacement today in a patient, I tell them that about at 20 years, I expect close to 90 to 95% of those patients to still be having a well-functioning hip in them. So it, the time frame from which your original surgery, when you need a revision, um, may, depending upon when you had your original hip replacement, maybe never. I mean, the, when I'm uh, replacing patients' hips today in their, in their 50s and 60s, I'm fully anticipating that, that all the, that the vast majority of those patients will actually uh, die with that hip replacement in them and having had nothing done to them. Uh, how long should a new hip replacement last? So I, I think I just hit upon that with that um, there's really no expiration date. It's not like milk to where um, once you hit that date, uh, it kind of begins to go sour. Um, it's kind of a gradual time over process of just depending upon of multiple factors um, of today's hip replacement of like how, how hard is it being used, obviously how young is the patient, um, and, and things of those nature. So I, I like I said, I, I fully anticipate patients to have about a, at least a 90% survivorship at 20 years uh, for their hip replacement today. Do you recommend a rehab stay if the person lives alone? So I, there, there's lots of factors that go into that, but what I would say is that the best place for a patient to go after the hip replacement is, is either to the, back to their home if it's possible, whether that's having a, a family member or a, uh, a loved one or a, a good friend come and stay with you for a brief period of time to help you out, or going and staying with that person. The reason why we try to avoid a rehab center, um, even before COVID happened, was the fact that there's really only a couple places in the world where it's socially acceptable to lay in bed for 20 plus hours in a day, and that's at a rehab center or a hospital. So really, I, I think about it, patients, your, your recovery doesn't really start until you leave the hospital and you get home, because when you're at home, it's not like a small room in a hospital or rehab center where, the, where you've got a bathroom right next to your bed, or you've got a chair right next to your bed, and all you, you have to just walk a few steps to get to all those things. You have to get up and walk around a lot more in your house, whether you want to drink of water, whether you have to go to the bathroom, whether you want a bite to eat, whether you're going to go up and down the stairs to get to your bedroom to, to lay down and take a nap or go to bed. And all of those things, those are, that's all therapy. So you, you really are doing therapy by, by getting back to your house. And it's even been shown that we, out of a randomized clinical trial that we performed here at Rothman, that we took patients and randomized them to formal physical therapy or to having no physical therapy and just kind of being, being told, get back to your daily activities. Here's some exercise. Here's an exercise pamphlet for you to do. And at no time point was there any difference in the patient's function at any, at, at any follow-up period uh, up to a year even. And so we know that, those pa that patients after a hip replacement do quite well if we can get them back into their environment and get them uh, doing their, their activities. So uh, long story short, I would say if it's safe, the best place for you to get to it is, is at home or another uh, person's house that you can stay at for a brief period of time while you recoup. Okay. Um, one of the questions was how soon can you walk upstairs and also how long before you can drive? So um, how long, so immediately you can start walking upstairs as soon as your spinal has worn off and you have motor function returned to your lower extremity. Um, in terms of driving, that's going to be completely dependent upon whether it's a right or left uh, hip replacement and whether or not you have an automatic or a manual transmission. So assuming you have a uh, 
manual or sorry, an automatic transmission for a left hip replacement, I, I say there, there's one criteria for you being able to drive, and that's that you cannot be taking a narcotic. And when we say not taking a narcotic, I think about it like alcohol. You can have beer, wine, cocktails with dinner, wake up and drive to work the next day. You can't wake up, have a Bloody Mary with breakfast and drive to work. So it's the same, that same idea that when you wake up in the morning, you can go drive, do what you need to. And if at, at, the, end, at the end of the day, you're really sore, you're feeling it that you were moving around a lot more and you want to take a pain pill, you can do that and still continue to drive the next day. But it's just once you've taken that pain pill, you really kind of need to uh, uh, not drive. For patients who have a right hip replacement, they have that same uh, stipulation regarding the narcotic, but they have the additional stipulation that they need to be able to go from the gas to the brake rapidly. And so usually it's somewhere, I, I find it when patients are able to shed their walker and, and only use a cane or are using no walking aid to get, a lot, get around, that's usually a pretty good indication that they're ready to start driving again. But what I on average, it's about the six week marker is when most patients are ready to start driving again. But I always say, let's be safe about it. Have, a, have a, somebody take you to an open parking lot. You drive, drive around, and without, them, without you knowing when to, to stop, have them tell you, say, stop. If you feel like you were able to get from the gas to the brake pretty rapidly then, and stop the car, then, that's a, then you're probably ready to start driving. The other thing that I would uh, also recommend doing is that when you are going and when you decide that you're ready to go back to driving, it's really all about the distance that you leave to, for you to stop. So whatever your normal driving uh, distance is that you leave yourself between you and the car in front of you, I would make that always a little bit longer early on to just give yourself a little bit more of a buffer uh, when you're when you're out driving when you right afterwards. Uh, one of the last questions, do you do both hips at the same time? If not, how far apart do you time out the procedures? So I, I will perform uh, both hips simultaneously or within the same uh, operative setting. Um, there, I have a couple stipulations on that. Um, essentially, we, we used to do simultaneous, we call simultaneous bilateral uh, hip or or bilateral knee replacements all the time. And then we noticed that there was an increased risk of complications in, some of the, in a certain subset of those patients. And we found that the, the, the subset of patients that are at a much greater risk of complication are gonna be patients who are over the age of 70, patients who have a significant cardiac history, and patients who have a BMI of greater than 35. So really, what I, what I do is I, I limit the, the, what we call simultaneous uh, bilateral hip replacements or knee replacements to patients who um, are under the age of 70, have no major cardiac history, and um, have a BMI of less than 35. If, they, if a patient either does not want to proceed forward with both of them at the same time, or um, does not meet the criteria to, to safely have them done both at the same time. I would say that waiting anywhere from six weeks to 12 weeks is ideal. It really depends upon how you're doing with your recovery as to how quick you want to, to turn around. Some patients, they wanna be fully recovered and have that full three months when we say most patients are doing most things before they go back to, and have another one. Other patients are like, you know what, I wanna to try to overlap my recovery um, as much as I can um, when it's safe. And I would say about the six week marker is probably when it's, it's safe to, uh, to go back in and do another, another surgery on a, on a patient. Okay. Um, what, if anything, can a person do to prepare for surgery and recovery, assuming weight loss? So the, the best thing that you can do is just simply trying to maintain your activity and working on strengthening of your, your uh, the muscles around your hip and your core muscles. So we think about your spine, the, the big muscles in the back of your spine and your abdominal muscles. Those are the things that you can do to, to best kind of prepare yourself for the, the surgery. Okay. And last question, is it possible to play competitive ice hockey after a hip replacement age 50? Yeah, it certainly is 
is possible to play competitive ice hockey afterwards. I would say that you're, you're asking quite a bit of the hip replacement, but um, it, I wouldn't, let's put it this way, I would not have a hip replacement just because you're not able to play competitive ice hockey. I would wait until um, there's other things that are limiting you as well, um, but I would say that there is a very reasonable chance that a young, healthy patient um, who has an uneventful hip replacement would be able to, to get back to playing ice hockey. Right. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Fillingham, for taking the time to get on here and educate us. Um, I will follow up with everybody via email so you have my information, Dr. Fillingham's information, and our VIP line should you need to make an appointment. All right. Thank you.